Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Welcome to Auto Line Daily for Thursday, May 6, 2010. Here is the news. Tongues were a wagon yesterday as General Motors shook up its marketing staff once again. Remember, Bob Lutz held that top marketing job at GM only a few months ago when he was eased to the side and replaced by Susan Doherty. That's about the time that GM said all the big management changes at the company were over, except that they were not. Yesterday, GM eased Susan Doherty to the side and replaced her with Joel Awanek, who came from Nissan, or barely came from Nissan, I should say. Iwanek had only been at Nissan for six weeks, who had hunted him away from Hyundai, which is where he created memorable advertising that helped Hyundai double its sales. I've got to believe that everybody at Nissan is hopping mad to see somebody at that level leave the company after only six weeks. Iwanek has got to be the hottest property in the business right now, but tasked with turning around GM marketing will show us if he is as good as everyone thinks he is. Meanwhile, GM says it will soon announce a new position for Susan Doherty, which suggests this whole shakeup came together quickly and unexpectedly. Otherwise, they would not be parking Doherty on the sidelines until they can figure out what to do with her. Renault just introduced several new models to its Megane range, two sport versions and a convertible. The sport versions, called the GT and GT Line, feature a special chassis to deliver a more sporty ride. Both can be equipped with the current choice of engines in the Megane lineup. Additionally, the GT is available with two turbos, a diesel or a gas. The GT versions will be available in June. The convertible has new styling inside and out. It offers three gas engines or three diesels, which can be mated to a six-speed manual, six-speed dual clutch, or a CVT. But the most unique thing about the car is the folding panoramic roof, which Renault went with because it reduces wind noise and supposedly provides greater resale value. The convertible goes on sale in May. And in other Renault news, the company announced, along with its partner in India, Bajaj, that the two will develop a small car to compete with the Tata Nano. According to the AFP, the vehicle should be on the road by 2012 for a price of only $2,500. And they're also focusing on fuel economy, aiming at 71 miles per gallon. That's only 3.3 liters per 100 kilometers. Hopefully, this thing will not burst into flames like some nanos have been known to do. Bloomberg reports that Toyota cut the cost of its fuel cell technology by 90% compared to the mid-2000s. It did this mainly by reducing how much platinum it uses in the system. Interestingly, the automaker might be able to sell its first hydrogen-powered vehicle for about $50,000. And Toyota has always said it would like to have a car like this ready for sale by 2015. Toyota wants this thing profitable from the get-go, something that could help boost support for the technology. You know, whether you believe in climate change or not, no one can deny that fossil fuel emissions are nasty. But what if there was a way to turn carbon dioxide into something useful like fuel? According to The Guardian in the UK, it could happen. Sure, CO2 can be converted into fuel by plants and algae, but it takes forever for a tree to grow and even longer for petroleum or coal to form. One key to speeding up the process is figuring out a way to convert carbon dioxide, CO2, into carbon monoxide, CO. The Fisher trough process can do this, but it takes a lot of energy. Researchers around the world are looking into less energy intensive ways of doing this from chemical means to marine bacteria. They're also looking into ways of sucking carbon right out of the atmosphere, although that's pretty difficult to do. All this may sound like science fiction today, but who knows, 50 to 100 years down the road, our whole world might be powered by this stuff. Hit the link in today's show to learn more about this. Bill Nye, the science guy, loves his electric Mini E, but what's he got to say about the Chevy Volt? We'll get to that right after this. Introducing Bridgestone's third generation of run-flat tires with groundbreaking new Bridgestone technologies. Bridgestone run-flat tires offer improved ride comfort, lower rolling resistance, and improved wear while giving you the peace of mind and comfort you need. And now it's time for some of your feedback. 
This is You Said It, where I get a chance to respond to some of your correspondence. Lex saw our interviews with Bill Nye, the science guy, who had a television program aimed at getting kids interested in science. We interviewed Nye to get his impressions of what it was like leasing an electric Mini E. But Lex wrote in to say, I want to ask Ed Whitaker, why isn't Bill Nye driving a Chevy Volt? Bill Nye is an excellent advocate for electric vehicles, especially one made in the USA. Well, Lex, turns out that we had asked Bill Nye what he thought about the Volt, so we went back to that interview and pulled this sound bite. I'll tell you what I'm excited about. I had the chance to drive the Chevy Volt prototype, and I would just as soon have that vehicle for a few reasons. It started out as, as an electric vehicle, so there's a whole bunch of details that are improved. You know, this car has no back seat, no trunk, no uh, place to put things. Uh, the um, Volt <clears throat> drove surprisingly well. It was at night and it was raining in Southern California, and so everything was quite slippery. The car performed very well. I was very impressed, and the amenities the crazy kook ball modern electronics, global positioning system, sat nav, whatever you call it, um, the display, the music, all was very, very good. So uh, the drivetrain looks pretty good. I was at a trade show, I was at the National Science Teacher Convention, uh, the United States' National Science Teachers Convention last week, and they had the display of the Volt. Uh, so this would be the Volt drivetrain uh, on sheet metal essentially. And I looked at it pretty carefully. It looks very good. They made a couple decisions that I don't understand, but I'm not uh, working on these things full time. I'm not an engineer on these things full time. So I got a feeling somebody was thinking about it because it's the same bunch of people that did the EV1. And as we all say, everybody who had the use of the EV1 thought it was the greatest car ever. And what were they thinking when they discontinued it? So uh, if it's that same bunch of people giving it another 10 or 15 years of thought, it should be a really good car. And as a guy who grew up in the US, I would very much prefer uh, that the United States auto industry, although it's globalized, that the United States auto industry was making a comeback. I would really like that. I'd like to be part of that. Don't forget to tune in tonight for AutoLine After Hours when our guest will be Chantel Leonard, Ford's group marketing manager for global small and mid-size cars. I know I'll have a lot of questions to ask her about how she plans to market the Ford Fiesta in the American market. As always, I'll be joined by the auto extremist himself, Peter DeLorenzo, and that encyclopedia of automotive information, David Welch from Business Week. And right after AutoLine After Hours, we'll launch right into Open Line a new way of getting automotive information, but where you can participate directly in the discussion. Things kick off a little after 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can tune in on our website, AutolineDetroit.tv, or just pick up your phone and dial 218-936-6581. Then you have to enter the pin 11085. You can jump in on the discussion or just sit back and listen, but I warn you, you might get sucked in for hours. And that's it for today's installment of AutoLine Daily. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.